Now, here's Bishop Kimball with today's message. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. That's a, that's a, a sign of any Christian. If, if you're a Christian, you could be in any situation, in any place, among any people. There's one thing that's going to cause you to stand up from the crowd is your joy. Yes. Your joy. Your joy. Your joy. You know what God has done for you. You know where you're going. You know what God wants you to do. You have no reason to be nothing else or less but joyful. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. You may have your seats, ladies and gentlemen. As we prepare to move along with the Word of God, there's something that I think we should look at. Uh, speaking of Jesus and the transformed life and the church, what is God doing here? He's preparing us for ministry. It doesn't seem like it a lot of times. Doesn't feel like it a lot of times, but we are being prepared for ministry. If you turn to the 105th Division of Psalms, and I want to read a few verses there. Psalms 105. And I'm going to be again reading at verse 16, just a few verses here. And he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. I, I, I want to read 19 again. Until the time that his word came to pass. The Lord, the word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. In the margin, you see verse 20. Uh, Verse, verse 19, I believe it is, until the time that his word, the word of the Lord did what now? Tested or refined him. It worked on him until God wanted to come to pass, happened. And that's where we stand today. We stand in between what God said and the fulfillment of it. What's happening in between there? Everything. Sin, sickness, disease, death, pandemics. All these things happen between what God spoke and the fulfillment of it. This is where most of the trouble starts. This is where most people turn back and walk away from God. This is where a lot of trouble is when people are not sold out to God. I want to read it again. He said, until the time that his word came to pass, the word that God given to, to Joseph when he was 17 years old, the word of the Lord tested him. Until the time. And I, 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 I call this preparing for ministry. Preparing for ministry. Preparing for what now? Yeah. Ministry. It's more than having oil poured on you. It's more than some ceremony. Yes. There are some trials. There are some things God sent you through. Until the time, there was a certain time God said, every last one of us have a time yes. that God set for us. Yes. A proper time God set. It was a point in time that God would fulfill his word. If you have a promise from God, you are not in a trap by it not happening. There's that gap of time that God's going to work to fulfill it. 
It was a point of time that God will fulfill his word. There's a set time. God has set a day. I said very often that he will judge the world. That time is drawing near. The clock didn't stop. The clock never stops. It's ticking with God. In the interim of the gap and the fulfillment of it, something was going on, and something will always go on. The word of the Lord tested him. He was being proved. God was examining him. He was being purged, purified. It was during that time all of these negative bad things was happening to him, but God was working too. You may not have the best of life. You may not live in the best of times, but God is still purging and working and moving you toward the fulfillment of that word. Don't get trapped and caught up on what's going around you. You have to understand that you accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You joined the body of Christ. You want to serve the Lord. So he says, let me prepare you. It's more than a class. It's more than a lesson. It's life experiences that prepares us. The Word of God tested him. Examine him. Every day God is doing this. Holding to God's word in the midst of trouble is very difficult. Yes, it is. It's not easy as some would think, but it's not impossible. Holding on to what God said. Joseph at 17 had a dream. It wasn't fulfilled until he was 30 years old. 13 years it went by. But God was doing what? Testing him, proving him, examining him. You ever wonder why things happen and certain people come into your life and certain events happening because God is moving you toward what he promised you, but in the interim there, he's refining you. He's making you for that purpose. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 5, it starts with God giving a dream to a teenager. And this dream sent his life into such a nightmare. It was like a spiral. Uh, a spiral. He, he was going out of control in a sense. Why? His brothers began to hate him, even to the point they wanted to kill him. Why would God give me something that would stir my brothers to kill me? Sold as a slave to Potiphar. Put into prison because of a lie for two full years, and all the while God had given him this dream, for 17 years this boy had to live between what was happening to him and what God said. Now that's where we are today, what God promised you and what's happening around you. You got to focus on one of them. You got to give in to one of them, what God has said or what's happening all around, what's happening in the world. God is proving you. You are much better than what's around you. You are much better than what's in this world, and God wants you to take that stand and verbally and wholeheartedly make your voice be heard. I serve the Lord. Yes. He's put into prison. But after God had sent him through them series of tests, He's elevated by Pharaoh because of God. Pharaoh had a dream, and it was interpreted by Joseph because this is what Joseph recognized. God has an answer. God has an answer. It is not in me, is what he tells Pharaoh. I can't answer, but God will give you a favorable answer. And you know what? God began to let Joseph know right then that he had something special with him. Just as Joseph said, there would be seven years of plenty, he interpreted the dream to Pharaoh, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. During this famine, all the people of the land had to come to Egypt to get grain. And guess who was over the grain? The slave that was sold, the prisoner that was put in prison behind a lie. And he didn't complain. He didn't ask God why. He didn't back away from God. He went through it. He proved to God that you can trust me. Yeah. 
And what did God do? God put him in a position where the whole land had to trust him. Are you listening to me? Don't back away from what God promised you. Don't give in to these times. My God, God got the answer for everything you need. Don't stop serving God. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading the Bible. These times were given by God, and you have to make the decision which way you're going to go. You make that decision. God used a famine to fulfill his purpose. Just like this pandemic we have today, it's fulfilling God's purpose. It's letting us know if we're passing the test or not. Are we still committed to God? Are we still committed to the prayer and the reading of the Word of God? The pandemic is fleshing some things out. The pandemic is letting God know you can't trust some of these people. You can't rely on some of these people. I want you to take a stand, and I want you to let God know you can depend on me at any time in any situation. I'm here to do your will because God has set a time for everything he promised us is going to be fulfilled. Do you think God let something slip by you? Do you think God forgot something? We're his children, you're his child. Every person, every situation, everything that comes into my life and your life is guided by God. Everything guided by God. To do what? To get you to the place he promised you. That, that's what he's doing. We think that if God give us a promise, all I got to do is keep confessing. Just say it, just say it, just put it in the air. But then when somebody comes along or something comes along to make you stronger in your faith, you knock it back. You leave the person. You don't want to be made that way. You want God to give me everything I want. Because if I ask him and believe it, I shall receive it. Well, what about the trial you got to go through? What about the test God want to send you through? What about the strength of, 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 of commitment and courage God wants to build in you? It's not just I believe it and I receive it. I have a time that God set for me. And during that time, I got to prove myself to God that you can depend on me. The Word of God is testing you right now. Today, it's testing you. Will you hold on? Will you let God purge you? Will you let God examine you? Why don't you let God prove you? Prove to God, you that shouting saint you are in church. Prove to God you mean everything you say. Moving Israel from slaves to owners took 40 years, and they still were not where they should have been at the end of those 40 years. It's going to take more than a week or a year or two. It's going to take a lifetime. So you should just prepare your life to be used of God, to be made by God all of your life. It's not a once a week experience. It's not a weekday Bible study. It's a life It's what it is. Every second, every hour, every day of your life, God is tweaking and turning and perfecting because he promised you something down the road. Are you listening to me? God was teaching them in the wilderness how to live like a kingdom of priests. He said he wanted a kingdom of priests. That's what he wanted. In a land that had nothing to do with him, it was a dry land. They didn't worship God over in Canaan land. He didn't want them to have the same mind as slaves when they went into that land. He wanted them to go into the land with the mind he was trying. He was really trying hard to put in them in the wilderness, but they fought his hand. 
Every time he wanted to take them to a place to trust him by not having food there, they fought his hand. We used to the natural. Give us what Pharaoh gave us. God said, I got something better than Pharaoh. Just trust me. Just trust me, Lord. I'm caught up in this world system, this economics and all the things that are going on in the world. God said, just trust me. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. The earth is mine. The gold is mine. The sieve is mine. Why don't you trust me? He didn't want them to have the same mind. God don't want you to come into the kingdom prepare for ministry and think like you thought before you came to church, before you joined Jesus. God doesn't want you acting and thinking that way. That's the way of the world. In Deuteronomy 8, 25, between the promise to take them in until they entered. This is what happened during those 40 years. God said he was humbling you, testing you, taking you away from what you are used to. Oh, now that's a heavy thing there. Woo. I'm going to have to stop right there. Taking you away from what you're used to. I'm not used to people saying things to me and I don't say back. I'm not used to taking stuff. In the world, you know, I'm telling you, everybody's just so quiet and they know what I'm talking about. You're not used to people saying certain things to you. I'm not used to that. But now God brought us to a place where he want us to not demote my mouth. <laughs> he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before her shears is dumb, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Testing you. Taking you away from what you are used to. We don't want to need that. Making you understand that your life is based on the word of God, not on situations in the world. Your life is based on the word of God. Jesus says man does not live by bread alone. How does man live? How does man live? By every word. Is that how we live? No, no. There's no bread. We get afraid. Doesn't make no difference what the word of God say. If, if there's nothing flowing in the house, then we get terrified. We begin to ask God why. It's a test. He's proving you. You said you accept Jesus as your Savior. You said you'll follow Jesus. You said you'll be a disciple. You said you want to be a member of the body of Christ. Now God says, I want you to show me something. You joined the body of Christ. You weren't pushed in here. You weren't forced. Nobody put a gun to you and said, accept Jesus. On your own free will, you say, Jesus is my Savior. I accept him. I follow him till the day I die. Yeah. Let's see how strong that commitment is. Making you understand that life is not based on what you see or what is said is based on the Word of God. We eat by the Word of God. We live by the Word of God. We're sustained by the Word of God. We're protected by the Word of God. That's all we have as Christians. Are you with me? Amen. Providing for you and taking care of you. Who's doing that now? God is doing that. I saw this family yesterday. I, I told my wife about it. I saw his family. It's a man, his wife, and three children. One of them was a girl. I saw, I don't know who the other two were. Three children. And he's got a sign. Fell on hard times. Please help me and my family. You know what initially, the first thought came to my mind? Where is the body of Christ he's a part of? Where is the body of Christ? He's a part of. None of us lived it to ourselves. None of us belong to ourselves. That's not what ministry is all about. That's not what Jesus teaches. That's, that's, that's not what he teaches. What he teaches is that God will provide for you and take care of you. He will touch somebody's heart. 
Are you listening to me? If you're around the people that have the heart of God, somebody's heart going to be moved to do something. If one member suffer, what did the scripture say? We all suffer. You know, it's really a shame. It has got to the point where I call it a most serious sin when we turn our backs on each other, when there's a serious need, a sustaining need for life, and we act like nothing is going on. This isn't what God called us together for. He called us together to learn to be ministers. We ministry. He is disciplining you, and that's a difficult thing there. As a man disciplines his son, not like a criminal is disciplined, but as a father disciplines his son. What are you going through, my dear friends? Is God positioning you for the purpose of doing what? Bringing him glory. Bringing him glory. You glorify God when you don't complain. You glorify God when you reach out to each other, when you pray for each other, you glorify God. Joseph made it through all he went through. Abraham made it through. 75 years old, God gives him a promise, and he's 100, and 100 years old when God fulfilled the promise. So 25 years, God tested that man. Are you going to hold out till the promise comes? 25 years giving them promises, making it difficult for them to happen in the natural. Look at God telling them he's going to do things, but they don't happen the way they ought to happen. That's God. When he say he'll take care of us, what does that mean? That means he will take care of you, even if it is the last day. God's going to keep his word. Now, you, you, you know, we, we, we come to the house of God. We hear the word of God so we can learn how to serve God. Listen at the scripture. Job made it through. Why? Why did this man make it through a death door? God brought him back to life and restored double. Does that mean anything to anybody? You will make it also, but you must keep the word. You have to follow this word of God. You got to read the Bible. You got to stay in the fellowship. You need to hear the word of God taught. One of the most difficult things it is is to try to tell people what God wants when they don't believe he said it. They don't believe he'll do it. You will make it, but you have to keep the word of God before you. You have to stay before God. Trials and persecution test your what? Your confession and your commitment. That's what they confess. That's what they, they, they bring out. Uh, they, they test what you say and what you are committed to. They prepare you for where God is taking you. But we don't, we don't like that part of life. God can never lie. We call the gap that we're in between what God said and the fulfillment of it, we call it a trap, but it's a gap. It's not a trap. You're not in a trap. God is going to fulfill it. Are you listening to me? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 32, 34, it said, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war. God's ways are so counterculture. It doesn't make sense to those who are caught up in the world's way of thinking. And this is a big thing that's being talked about today. The people who sit in God's house professing to be God's servants, they're caught between what? The world's way of thinking and God's way of thinking. That's the big trap now. In many areas, the world and the scriptures clash. They don't agree. They bump heads. What do you tell a person or a friend who is going through tough times like today? How would you counsel someone who is facing a life or death challenge? What about someone who has lost a job? I'm talking to a couple of uh, people right now. What about people who can't see their way beyond their misery? The counsel of the world is difficult. But they say, be strong. Man up, man, man up. Quit acting like that. Think positive. Don't be down on yourself. This is, this is, this is how the world thinks. It is true that Scripture exalts us to be strong. 
Yes, it does. But Scripture adds something to that exhortation that we should understand. Be strong where? In the Lord. Say it loud. Be strong where? In the Lord. Don't just be strong. In the Lord and in the power of his might. 2 Timothy uh, 2 1 says, You therefore, my son, what did he say? Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, we read in Joshua 1 9, he said, Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Be strong. That's all you need, Joshua. Just be strong and of good courage. For the Lord your God is with you. For the Lord your God is where? with you. Doesn't mean things won't happen to you. It means things won't destroy you. Things won't get you down. Things can't stop you from praising God. Things can't take your joy. We're told in these few verses that our strength in time of need is in God and His grace. When the world tells you to be strong, man up. Stop crying. Stop complaining. They never tell you where the strength supposed to come from. Jesus said, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing means nothing. Not even a small thing. Like getting up in the morning, like putting your clothes on without help. Without me, you can what now? Do nothing. In Jeremiah chapter 9, this is what Jeremiah says. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his wife. It, it might. I didn't mean wife. Boasting in your wife. <laughs> please, please, gentlemen. <laughs> That's a misinterpretation. <laughs> Boast in his might, but not the rich man boasting his riches. That's what they boast in. But let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. God wants you to boast. God wants to, to have us talk about what he's doing in our lives. I, 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 I just enjoy talking about the, the great things God's doing for me. I, I, I tell you, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to have God with you. And, and when he put it in you, he wants you to minister to other people. Don't join the pity party. Please, people of God, don't join in with that. Don't talk about how bad you're doing. Don't talk about how evil it is. All gas is so high. All gas is so high. The earth is the Lord to come from the earth, didn't it? Didn't, didn't it come from the earth? God must have put it there. Don't you know he know where it is? If it's in the earth, the gold, the silver, all that's mine. It's in those hills, the, the brass, all of it mine. Don't you know God knows where it is, and he knows where you are, and he knows how to bring together the two, but doing that interim is called a time of testing. As far as the world is concerned, self-reliance and control over your life it's a great, great achievement. You see it every single day, every day. Today's culture does not accept the term weak. No one likes being weak because we like to be in control of things and people. Being in control makes you feel powerful. Powerful is the order of the day for this culture we live in. Everybody wants power. Everybody wants to influence. Everybody wants things to go away. Everybody wants everybody to believe what they believe. And it's a war. There's so many wars going on in the world. Do you realize that? A wars all over the place. Everybody is trying to pull you their way. How to win friends and influence people. You ever heard of that? Oh, yeah, you have. Dale Carnegie, it's an old book, but it's out there. The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. You ever heard of that? 48 Laws of Power, and people buy this. Law three, conceal your intentions. Don't let people know your intentions. 
act like you mean them good, but all the while you want to pull their neck off. Conceal your intentions. What an ungodly thing that is. Law 15, crush your enemy totally. Not the devil, a person. Crush your enemy totally. Law 20 states, do not commit to anyone. And you want to follow this sick world? You want its influence? You want its jargon and its ways? Do not commit to anyone. Law 7, get others to do the work for you, but you always take the credit. This is what the world reads. This is what the world do. How to control, influence, manipulate, and persuade anyone by Anthony King. You ever heard of that? How to control Jesus Christ. Influence. That sounds demonic. Satan influenced Eve back in the garden. He was controlling the conversation. Manipulate and persuade anyone. What is the real message here, people of God? Just listen to the title of the books. You can have influence over people. You can crush your enemy. You can get credit for what you didn't do. You can control, influence, manipulate, and control. Yes, you can have power and be strong in the eyes of the world. God have mercy. In Scripture, we are instructed to confess our faults one to another. Ah, just opposite. I guess some would say, now those other titles sound better. Confess your faults where? Nobody does that. You see, they didn't say a word. I say nobody does that. But it's God's word. I'm going to read it to you. Confess your faults one for, to another and pray for one another. Well, it seems through our conversation with one another, we are faultless. You don't want to talk about fault. You talk about something that makes me feel acceptable in your sight. Faultless. We faultless. We sinless. How you doing? Blessed and highly favored. God's with me, been with me all day and all. Yeah, you are. That's how we talk as Christians. We hide behind this fake mask of all rightness when all the time we're falling apart. Yeah. All the time we're worried about the economy, we're worried about the world, we're worried about the pandemic, but when we get in each other's face, oh, hi, child, how you doing? Bless, stop lying. <laughs> stop it. It takes a strong person to confess their faults. It takes a person with God in them to do what? Confess their faults. We often want to talk about how we won the conversation. How we told them. I let them know just how I felt. Jesus never did that. And you following him. There comes a time when God is taking you through this time where all of that, I'm all right, I'm all right. I told them about myself. I know how to win friends. I know how to influence people. All of that got to fall off. And the promise is going to be fulfilled. All right. are, are you with me? Being in control is not showing people how powerful you are. It is showing how spiritually weak you are. That's what it's showing. How spiritually weak you are. Nobody won't talk to me today. I, I guess I just cut it off and we'll go get something to eat. 
In Hebrews 11, we read about the men and women of faith who are greatly used by God. Then in verse 34, it says, Out of weakness were made strong. My God, out of what now? We're made strong. If we would have chosen people to carry on the work that God has chosen some of to carry it on, we would have chosen the mighty, the influential, the well-equipped, the well-educated, the strong ones. But God chose, good God Almighty, the weak things of the world because he wanted to make them strong. My God. Two things have to happen and then I'll, I'll end. Pride must be avoided. Quit thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Pride must be avoided. Pride must be avoided. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it's a very, 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 uh, what I call important scripture because it talks about the apostle Paul and you know he was so full of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians uh, 12, verse 7, listen what it says. Because of surpassing greatness of the revelation. Now you know this scripture, you, you know, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation God had, had, had given him. For this reason, to keep me from being exalted by myself. See, Paul made it known that it is possible for a human to have something from God and it elevates him beyond his brothers. Ah. Uh, you don't minister above people. You have to be on their level. You have to sit with prostitutes. You have to go home with beaters and cheaters like tax collectors. See, oh, we, we, we beyond this now. If you're being trained and, 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 and groomed for ministry in the kingdom of God, everybody counts to God. Everybody counts to God. You know, it's one of the most cruelest, evilest, sinful things Christians could do is they group together with people like them. We only like certain people. Why? Why is that? I'll tell you in a minute. He says, uh, to keep me from being exalted above myself, exalting myself, to keep me from exalting myself, God knew Paul was capable of doing it. God knows what we're capable of, capable of too. Every time we wonder why I'm not moving in the Lord, maybe he's trying to get rid of some more of that pride you got. Maybe God is working on something you don't want to let go. If you're going to minister, be a full minister, be everybody minister, and minister things that God has done for you. That's the first thing. That's the first thing I like to talk about, what God has done for me. I talked the last, if God spared my life, here in, in October, 45 years. I got some roads I've been down. I got some experience, man. I could tell you some things. I've been there. I've been in it. I know. I know what God can do. And I still have my life because of God, my health, my strength, because of God. Now, that's my testimony. I don't know where you've been or what you've done, but I know it hadn't all been good, and we ought to be willing to confess what God has done in our lives. Paul said, to keep me from, being, from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. For what? To torment me. God had to keep prodding him every now and then to let him know. You're still my servant. A message of Satan to torment me. For what reason? To keep me from exalting myself. Jesus, have mercy. He was given a vision of heaven. Paul saw things no one else had seen. You see the temptation? If Paul lived today, he'd write a book. He'd go on a lecture circuit. He'd become the authority on heaven. 
He'll talk about things like no other people could talk about him because they hadn't seen what he's seen. They had experienced what he experienced. So in other words, he would be the authority. It's when we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think and begin to live independent of God. Some people think they don't need God. Some people think they've got to the place now that all I need to do is say a few Bible verses, uh, say a little few Christian things that I'm, I'm where God wants me. Oh, if you only knew. Proverbs 16, 5 says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished, I, I tell you. The pride of man will humble and the loftiness of men will abase. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Nobody is higher than God. James 4, 6, God resists the proud but give grace to the humble. Pride as we know it. This is how we know it. A person talks about themselves in a good way, talks about their accomplishments, talks about their superiority to others and their way they handle life. This is not the most common manifestation of pride. A pride-filled person never stops to set his mind on God. Set it there. Meditate on it. Spend an hour, 30 minutes even, with God. Rarely talks to God or read his word. They trust in their own ability, their own intellect, and their own strength. Their actions show, I'm the man. I got it all together. I'm strong. I got the answers. Pride is a result of feeling sufficient without God. That's what it is. Hmm. I'm about done. Give me a minute. You can't ministry in pride. You can't do ministry in pride. You can't serve God in pride. A thorn in the flesh called a messenger of Satan in 1270. A thorn was this wooden stick that was used to impale a person, you know. It's something like these sticks police officers have. And they use those sticks to get you under control. My God, sometimes they use them illegally. They're for torture and punishment. But it did what to Paul? It caused Paul to humble and be constantly reminded of his weakness. Going through these times we're living in now, don't get in a situation where you have figured out what's best for you because you don't know what's best for you. God will constantly remind us of our weakness. He will constantly remind us that we need him. That life, when God has worked and worked with us, he prepares us to do what? To do ministry. To do ministry. The second thing needs to happen for God's power to work through us, you have to understand and appropriate the grace of God. Grace is God's enabling power to do all he called us to do. That's, that's what it is. He's unmerited favor and all. God grace us so he, we can do what he called us to do. That's what grace is. Everything he demands of us, he makes available to us. If God sent you to do something, then he has made available what you need to do it. Are, are, are you with me here? Everything he demands, he makes available. He makes available to us. His grace is personal. And he said it's sufficient. And it is used specifically for what you are facing. God can grace you in it. He can bring you out of it. Physical illness, family problem, job, ministry, financial, and all other challenges. God's grace is all you need. God's grace Get on your knees and spend time with God. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul, and my strength is perfected in weakness. The weaker you are, the stronger I am in you. 
the less you have to pride about, the more I can give you. We're being prepared for ministry. Ministry. I'm going to read this last part and we're going to pray. In 2 Corinthians 9, the last part of verse 9, he says, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Maybe if I read it, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, he says, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast about my weaknesses. Nobody talk about their weaknesses. Nobody. What a shame. Everybody's strong in the Lord. He said, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can dwell in me. I know a lot of things I just said the past 40, 50 minutes sound very, what I would call, out of the realm of this culture. It's not what we do. Maybe because we haven't recognized yet, we can't handle it. You have to turn to the Lord for help. That's what you have to do. You have to turn to the Lord for help. This world looks at things from their own perspective. It sees things from their own view. Don't join in with them. This, this, is, this is what God wants us to know. You can't join in with the world. You can't. You have to see God in everything. You have to see him in it. Samson was strong only when he trusted God. Only when he trusted God. When he began to trust in his own strength and thought he had it all together, that's when his life fell apart. That's when his life fell apart. Paul says this, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Where has God called you to? The general term ministry, that service. It is beyond your strength, whatever he called you to do. And it's causing some concern. You don't have the resources to do what you say God called you to do. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. So what does he want you to do? God wants his power to rest upon you and for you so that you can look to him as he strengthens you and perfects you and makes you complete in all he called you to do. And that will involve trouble, tribulation, enemies, mistreatment, all that is between the call and the work. When you fight the process, you hinder the work. God knew what it was going to take for Joseph when he got to Egypt. He knew what it was going to take to be the number two man. Where God wanted to take you, he's going to prepare you. You've been called to ministry. So we could say like David said in the 27th Psalm, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Admit to God your weakness, people of God and you will see he is the strength of your life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes. Yes. The joy of the Lord is what now? My strength. My strength. My strength. The world's mindset the world's mindset is the way they see things, the way they react to things. But we are God's people. He's going to take care of us, believe me. Some go through the water, some go through the fire, but all come out on the other side. 
<laughs> it doesn't stop any of us. Father, I thank you for the church of the Lord Jesus. For the saints that you have called to the church and how you're preparing us to do ministry. But we don't want to do ministry. We want to be church members. We don't want the strength of the Lord. We want the favor of the world, the hell with the world. That's where it's going. That's where it's going. It's coming to naught, to nothing. It's going to burn with fervent heat one day. And you like that? Help us to be ministers of the grace of God. Help us to know that you're not trying to hurt us. You're not trying to destroy us. But you're bringing us to completion. You're bringing us to a place where you could set us on high like you did Joseph, like you did Christ, like you did the Apostle Paul. But all of these men were made by you. They were instructed by you. They went through trouble with you. Have mercy on the church today, Lord. We need you like never before in these difficult times when everybody is seeing things their own way and doing it according to their own understanding. Lord God, I pray today that you will have mercy on America and the church of the Lord Jesus. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to our right mind. Cause us to see that it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord God. Every morning, your mercies are new and fresh, and God, I thank you. Give us the joy. We have the power. We have the spirit. Now help us to break away from the ideas and from the practices of this world. I pray in Jesus' name. We are the church of the Lord Jesus. Yes. We are what now? Church. Yes, we are. We are followers of Christ. We have a transformed mind. Hallelujah. Yes. And we are moving forward in God. Yes. Help us to think the thoughts of God. And as Paul had so clearly stated, let this mind be in us individually that was also in Christ Jesus. I thank you, I praise you, and I bless you because you care for us, because you love us. You want us to be your ministers. You want us to be your representatives. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, God, we thank you even right now. You have committed unto us the minister of reconciliation. You have forgiven us. You have restored us. And even today, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for our shortcomings, for our inability to do what you ask us to do, Lord. Give us the strength. What the law could not do, you sent your son. Oh, yes, you did, Lord. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Give us a mind of service. Give us a mind to minister. Oh, yes, Lord. And help us not to follow the world as it hides behind doors, as it makes excuses. It's ministry to be done. Now is the time. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are so few. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. I spoke your word. And I pray that you confirm it. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, bless this ministry, bless the people here. Remember the leadership, oh God. Help them to see what ministry is all about. And I pray that they show themselves to be examples of a great and a mighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. You're using this pandemic, you're using it. You allowed it to come because you wanted it to come. It didn't come to destroy. It didn't come for us to run away. It came so that your purpose may be fulfilled. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name.
in Jesus' name. And the household of faith said, Amen. 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 Thank you.